We are now live from Austin, Texas. My name is Joe Duck, Practice Leader, Education Government for Workplace Answers. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today for implementing the Campus Save Act targeting sexual violence. This presentation is brought to you by Workplace Answers and your presenter, S. Daniel Carter of 32 National Campus Safety Initiative. Workplace Answers offers the most compelling and interactive online compliance training solutions in the higher education community. We bring cutting edge courseware and the latest training applications together with our professional services team to transfer the way you educate your faculty, staff, and students. Today's presenter, Daniel Carter, has worked to develop and secure passage of regulations for over six major pieces of federal legislation, including the Campus Sexual Assault Victims' Bill of Rights and 1998's Jean Cleary Disclosure of Campus Security Police and Campus Crime Statistics Act. He was recognized on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives in 2008 as probably the leading person in this nation in advocating more action and tougher action against crimes that are committed on campus. So Daniel, we are delighted to have you join us today. A few housekeeping well, items before we get started. You may submit questions to the speaker at any time by typing them through the chat feature, which is located to the left of your screen. Questions will be addressed at the end as time allows. We will also be conducting a few polling questions during the presentation. So when prompted, if you would please just click the radio buttons to select your answers, we would appreciate your input. Unfortunately, we will not be able to provide the actual PowerPoint slides today, but all registrants and attendees will receive an email with the link to review this recording and download an ebook document with some key takeaways of this webinar tomorrow. If you're on Twitter, we invite all of today's webinar attendees to use the hashtag Save Campus, both during the presentation and to extend the discussion after Daniel is finished. As a reminder, today's session is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to your presenter, Daniel Carter. Joe, thank you very much. Uh, first, let me thank Workplace Answers for hosting this important webinar. And I would like to thank all of the audience members for taking an hour out of your day to learn more about the new Campus Save Act. Um, I know we've got uh, a diverse audience, so I'd like to start with giving a little bit of background as to where the Campus Save Act fits into uh, the current regulatory picture. It is an amendment to the Gene Cleary Disclosure of Campus Security Policy and Campus Crime Statistics Act, which was first enacted in 1990 and most recently amended by the Campus Save Act earlier this year. The Campus Save Act is designed to serve as a complement to Title IX and of course the 2009 Dear Colleague letter uh, which the United States Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights put out that articulates uh, the expectations for how colleges and universities as well as K-12 institutions will address uh, sexual violence in the campus community. And it was enacted as part of the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013, and it was prompted, again, prompt, prompted by a series of investigative journalism reports, as well as advocate calls for improvements in the 20-year-old Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights, which many of you who are familiar with it, you will see that it actually updates it. Uh, for those of you who are newer to it, um, it, will, it actually replaces that law with significant improvements to how it works. And what the Campus Save Act actually does, the first thing it does, it actually provides for more inclusive crime statistic reporting. It adds dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. And that's a series of crimes that we'll be talking about more about later. Uh, it enhances the underlying Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights. It enhances prevention education requirements, enhances conduct proceeding guarantees for both accuser and accused, and this is important. This has been a large uh, debate really in some circles about whether or not this actually will provide less due process in the intent is that it's to provide equitable proceedings for both accuser and accused. Uh, there will be a national best practices report 
that will be released by the U.S. Department of Education in conjunction with other federal agencies. And it adds important new anti-retaliation and whistleblower protection provisions, which will be the last thing we address in this presentation. Now, many people think of the Clery Act, when they think of the Clery Act, they think of campus public safety, which is police or security. But in reality, the Clery Act applies and has res responsibilities for many, many other officials on campus, including student affairs personnel such as deans of students, resident assistants or advisors, human resource officers, athletic team coaches, student organization advisors, and other officials with significant responsibility for student and campus activities, as well as anyone that your institution has designated to receive a report of a crime. Now, sexual violence as defined by the Campus Save Act includes one long-standing definition and three new to Cleary terms. The first is sexual assault. It uses the FBI National Incident-Based Reporting System definition, which those of you who are familiar with Cleary, um, it has been a part of the law since 1992. Those are forcible sex offenses and non-forcible sex offenses. The new definitions are domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking, which are all drawn from the Violence Against Women Act. The U.S. Department of Education in May has stated that they expect institutions to, prior to regulations being issued to undertake a good faith effort to comply with the Campus Save Act. Uh, and that means the annual security report or the annual clery report that institutions are obligated to publish by October 1st. Uh, for the 2014 report, the U.S. Department of Education has asked that it include uh, calendar year 2013 statistics for the new crime categories, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. Now, one of the things that it's important to note uh, is that these are to be reported separately from the main Cleary statistics, uh, similar to how hate crimes are currently reported. Um, there's a main body of statistics that institutions report, but these are, were designed to be separated out. The main reason for that being is there's going to be overlap with these crime categories. For example, an incident of dating violence could also be an aggravated assault or a forcible sex offense. And in that case, this is noted completely, the intention is that it be noted separately. So the hierarchy rule, which requires that the most serious incident and the multiple offense situation be reported um, does not, is not intended to apply in this context. So for those institutions that are already beginning to collect their calendar year 2013 statistics, uh, that's something important to bear in mind. The education and policy requirements, we, which we are going to discuss in detail, take effect with the 2014-2015 academic year or earlier if an institution publishes their annual report um, after March 7, 2014. And as I previously stated, the U.S. Department of Education has said that they expect institutions to undertake a good faith effort. So what that means in essence is if you make an effort and you don't get it exactly right, and that's understandable. The regulations have yet to be issued. The proposed regulations are expected to be developed early next year uh, through what's known as negotiated rulemaking where constituency groups come together to advise the department. Um, that will occur through March of next year. Then the proposed regulations are open for public comment where everybody has an opportunity to weigh in. The proposed regulations will be uh, then open for comment period usually about 30 to 60 days. And final regulations are expected approximately a year from now, in November of 2014. So there's going to be a period over the next year um, where institutions are going to need to begin to put in place things through good faith efforts to, to comply with these requirements. 
uh, institutions that don't face the potential of $35,000 per violation fines. And for more egregious violations, all of this has never happened, uh, the loss of aid eligibility for violations. Well, thanks, Daniel. Um, we're going to take a pause here uh, is our first polling question. Um, lots of good information here. Um, so the first question, if everybody could respond, please, is how prepared is your uh, campus for the SAVE Act regulations? And while we're waiting for the results to come in, uh, Daniel, it sounds like we've got a, a lot of key information that's being presented here. Um, uh, a couple of questions might be if we could just spend a second or two, uh, if not now, but later towards the end of the uh, presentation to maybe reiterate some of the, uh, the key deadlines. Um, I know that's a, a lot to, to put into one slide, so um, as, we, uh, as we come through to that, we might, we might want to consider that. Absolutely. Um, well, I can give a little bit of background on how the law was designed. It was designed to give schools uh, at least a year uh, to come into compliance. And the effective date is that any annual security report produced one year or after the enaction of the law, which was on March 7, 2013, must contain the new requirements, the new policy statements, and the new statistics for the first calendar year 2013. So, from this point, institutions have about you know, just under 11 months uh, to make sure they have everything in place. And as a practical matter, um, if you're putting out your annual security report, say on October 1st, it should reflect the policies and procedures that are in effect for that academic year. So what I would strongly recommend is that institutions have all of the new policies and procedures, the educational programming, for example, that we're going to be talking about in place for the beginning of the academic term that October 1st will fall in for their institution. And the most important thing now is to be collecting your 2013 statistics and preparing policies and procedures to be in place by the 2014-2015 academic year. And if you can come into compliance sooner, that's great, but those are the deadlines. Great. Yeah, thanks for uh, summarizing that, Daniel. I think that uh, was definitely helpful for me and, and hopefully some folks out there. So interesting um, uh, statistics here. It looks like we've got, um, when, we, when we did the poll here, we've got um, almost half of the group has a team ready, but it seems like they lack understanding. So, um, and then we have uh, a few folks that say they're well prepared and uh, um, a minority there that uh, is, is really trying to figure out what's going on. So. Um, well, that's good. I appreciate everybody's participation there, um, and we'll continue on here, Daniel. Excellent. For those of you who are familiar with the Clery Act, uh, this term will be familiar for those of you who may be new to it. Um, this is a very inclusive uh, definition of sex offenses. It's actually more some of you may have heard that the uh, FBI recently updated their definition of forcible rape. Uh, since 1992, the Clery Act has actually used a more, already more inclusive definition that comes from the FBI's National Incident-Based Reporting System. And it defines a forcible sex offense as any sexual act directed against another person forcibly and or against that person's will or not forcible or against that person's will where the victim is incapable of giving consent. So it includes any sexual act where there's either lack of consent, inability to consent, or of course where there is actual force used uh, in the case. So the, the, def the, the, back, the term is actually somewhat misleading um, because it does include any case where there is merely lack of consent. It includes rape, sodomy, sexual assault with an object, as well as forcible fondling. So if there is a groping incident on campus, for example, that's the type of incident that is also included. But you have uh, the so-called acquaintance sexual assault cases that are definitely covered where there's merely a question of lack of consent. Uh, that is covered here, and that's very important to note. Sex offenses non-forcible are in limited to incest and statutory rape. 
These are rarely incidences that we see on campus, um, but they do occasionally happen, and they are reportable and are subject to all of the provisions that we're going to be discussing. So if there is a victim of incest or statutory rape, they are entitled to the same protections uh, as the victim of any of these other offenses. The new incidences are, begin with domestic violence. And this definition is taken from the Violence Against Women Act. And it's a fairly broad term, and there's one of the there may be some minor adjustments made during the regulatory process because there's a reference to uh, the laws of the jurisdiction receiving grant monies. But typically the way the Clery Act works is if something is a crime in your jurisdiction and it fits the definition, the federal definition used by Clery, then it triggers the requirements under Clery and is also reportable. So for example, if there is an incident of simple assault, and there's actually a definition of assault offenses provided uh, in the FERPA regulations, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, for those of you who may be familiar with that, um, that will actually encompass all of the crimes of violence that would trigger a domestic violence offense. So it doesn't necessarily have to be charged or even defined as domestic violence in your jurisdiction. But it's any felony or misdemeanor crime of violence committed by a current or former spouse and here is a new component or intimate partner of the victim by a person with whom the victim shares a child in common, by a person who is cohabitating with or ha has cohabitated with the victim as a spouse, or intimate partner by a person similarly situated to a spouse of the victim under the domestic or family violence laws of the jurisdiction, and or any other person against an adult or youth victim who is protected from that person's act under the domestic or family violence laws of the jurisdiction. So it's basically any act of violence committed by the parties described, um, and there may be some reference, just like there is with alcohol and drug violations to the laws of your jurisdiction. So would advise consulting with counsel or law enforcement in your jurisdiction about exactly when those laws apply. And this is the type of situation that could, would apply to students, but it's also going to apply to your employees. This is particularly important for your human resources officials. Um, if an employee reports that they have a, um, an incident of domestic violence, even if it occurred off campus, say it occurred at their house off campus, but they're afraid of their partner or former partner, then you don't have to report it because it's outside the, juris the geographic terms of Cleary's ge crime statistics reporting, but the rights that we're going to describe that apply uh, will apply in a case uh, that they're involved in. If I could uh, interrupt here, uh, that's, that's uh, some great information. I did have, um, if we could back up a second, we had a question come through about the, uh, the definition of forcible, non-forcible. This question comes from Richard. Wants to know if this includes several acts committed or uh, attempted against a person's will. Um, what, several acts? Yeah, the question is, uh, Forcible, non-forcible definition. Does this also include sexual acts committed or attempted against a person's uh, will that was on the forcible, non-forcible definition? That is an excellent question. Under Cleary, for statistical counting purposes, um, the attempts and completed incidents count the same. The only exception is homicide. An attempted homicide counts as an aggravated assault. Uh, but for all other cases, um, attempts and completed crimes count the same. Excellent question. Great. Thank you, Thank you Dan. Dating violence is similar to domestic violence, although it, it, it's shaped more by the nature of the relationship. The term dating violence means violence committed by a person who is or has been in a social relationship of a romantic or intimate nature with the victim and where the existence of such a relationship shall be determined based on the consideration of the following factors. The length of the relationship, the type of the relationship, the frequency of interaction between the persons involved in the relationship. 
And I know that this um, is presenting some very subjective criteria rather than objective criteria. And historically, the U.S. Department of Education has permitted institutional officials, particularly law enforcement or security personnel, to make determinations, uh, professional determinations based on their professional judgment and experience. The key will be to make a rational determination based on the evidence available and to document the information and the decision so that if there's ever a review conducted that you can justify what, why you treated this as an incident of dating violence or did not treat it as an incident of dating violence. So you know, making that judgment and having a sound basis for it and documenting it are the keys. And there is a seven-year records retention requirement under the Clery Act. So if there's an incident of dating violence reported to a campus security authority, uh, those records will need to be maintained for seven years. The final new crime category is stalking. And that means engaging in a course of conduct directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to fear for his or her safety or the safety of others or suffer substantial emotional distress. And again, these are somewhat subjective criteria and institutions will need to have personnel with experience in these areas make professional determinations um, about whether or not uh, these definitions are met. And uh, Daniel, this is uh, Joe again. We've got a, a couple of questions um, I think are important to address about uh, domestic violence, um, if we could, please. So we've got a, a question from uh, Lynette Deshaw that says, what about a male and a female who are just roommates in regards to domestic violence? It, it, the, the definition refers to cohabitation with the victim as a spouse or intimate partner. Um, it would not typically refer to individuals who are just roommates, such as you know, roommates in a residence hall room. If there's an incident of uh, violence between th them, I don't believe that that would be considered an incident of domestic violence because it refers to spouse or intimate partner. Um, now, if there were, there there are situations where it could potentially apply, but there would have to be that that would have to be the nature of the relationship between the two people involved. Another sure, that, excellent that question. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense, Daniel. Um, and then on that note, before we move forward here, um, there seems to be a few questions with regards to, um, can you just go a little further in explanation, Daniel, about uh, domestic violence that occurs off campus, off site? Well, the main difference between an incident of domestic violence that occurs off campus as opposed to one that occurs on campus, on public property, or on a non-campus property, such as a uh, remote classroom or Greek house, um, is that you, the institutions do not have to count that in their statistics. Um, the rights and protections that a victim has when they report it are going to apply whether it happened off campus or on campus. So the main difference is there's no statistical reporting obligation. Got it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then the last question is, has to do with the uh, does domestic violence and other new regs under the VAWA still adhere to the Cleary reporting areas? Absolutely. As I said, the, the Cleary crimes for, re for the statistical reporting purposes are limited to on-campus public property and non-campus properties. On-campus properties are, is the traditional area owned or controlled by the institution, used in direct support of the institution's educational purposes, classrooms, academic buildings, administration buildings, food courts, student unions, things like that. Uh, public property is parks, streets, and sidewalks immediately within or adja and adjacent to and accessible from uh, the campus. So like if there's an in and there's this for those of you who are familiar with it, it extends to the sidewalk on the other across the street from the campus. So there's the sidewalk, the street, and then the sidewalk. 
the edge of that sidewalk on the border of the campus is where the non-campus property reporting line ends. Uh, the only exception is if there's direct access to an area such as a public park or body of water. And in that case, uh, the limit is one mile from the point of access from the campus into the public park or body of water. But yes, for reporting purposes, the traditional standard query geography continues to apply. The only exception is right. that it's not subject. It's reported separately from the main body of statistics. So again, as like I said, if there's an incident of aggravated assault between two uh, between two intimate, part intimate partners, it's going to be reportable as an incident of domestic or dating violence, depending upon the context of their relationship. Uh, but it would also be reported as an incident of aggravated assault in the main query statistics. Great. Thank you for the clarification, Daniel. I think we, we left off with stalking, and we were going to describe uh, more about stalking and whether this applies to uh, sexually motivated stalking. Uh, so please continue. And I think that's an excellent question. And I, I, the intent, obviously, is this is intended to apply to relationship-type stalking. Um, and I think as to whether or not it may, that definition may be extended any as something that is going to be subject to discussion during the negotiated rulemaking process. And there will be an, an updated uh, reporting handbook that is scheduled to be released following um, the final regulations being issued that will offer additional guidance on this subject. Um, at this point, my understanding is the intention that it is intended to apply to relationship type stalking, um, but we are waiting for formal clarification from the Department of Education on that. But again, that's going to fall into the good faith reporting requirements. Um, so institutions should make good faith efforts to document all reports and make a professional determination as to whether or not they believe that it meets the definition. Now one of the areas that, um, quite frankly, I'm most excited about um, is the prevention and awareness education. So much focus has been on in the last year in particular about how institutions deal with incidents when they're reported. And that's very, very important. But ultimately, um, the advocates who came together to develop this legislation, one of our chief goals was empowering institutions to help eliminate uh, these challenges in the first place. And we believe that one of the major tools in doing that is prevention and awareness education that will start to change the environment, the social environments in our campus communities that tolerate it. And prevention and awareness education has actually been something required by the Clery Act all the way back as far as 1992. Um, but there were no specific uh, requirements provided merely that institutions had to offer some form of pre prevention and awareness education. Um, the new Campus SAVE Act will require that all incoming students and new employees receive primary prevention and awareness education, um, as well as institutions must offer ongoing prevention and awareness education for students and faculty throughout uh, the year. And this was something that was recommended uh, by the Dear Colleague letter under Title IX but not required. Uh, beginning with the 2014-2015 academic year, this is something that will in fact now be required. And primary prevention education is, is something that has been adapted from the public health model. It's programming and strategies intended to stop domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking before it occurs through the changing of social norms and other approaches. Um, the education offered must include a statement that the institution prohibits these offenses. It must provide the definition of the offenses and consent with respect to sexual conduct in the local jurisdiction of the institution. So this is something that will be done state by state. It is important to note that the reference to state by state definitions is solely 
solely for the educational programming requirement. The statistical, the statistical reporting definitions and the definitions for uh, when policies and procedures take effect rely on the federal definitions that we went over earlier. Uh, the prevention education must address bystander intervention as well as risk reduction. Um, risk reduction is the typical um, you know, don't walk alone at night type of thing. But overall, this is intended to really change the dynamic bot and one sort of shorthand way of putting it is changing the paradigm from how not to be raped or assaulted uh, to training the community on how not to rape or assault or tolerate those offenses when they see them about to happen or happen. And that's really what the bystander intervention education is about. It's about providing community members with safe tools when they see an incident have about to happen to intervene, such as to get someone, you know, to at separate someone from someone they believe may be taking them away to be sexually assaulted if they're too intoxicated to give consent, for example, uh, things like that. Thanks, Daniel, for that uh, synopsis there. We are at a, a point here. We're at our second polling question. Um, does your organization currently offer the required ongoing training? Uh, Daniel, a couple questions as the, as the audience uh, answers the questions there for the polls. Um, you mentioned that uh, it, it's now will soon be required that, that students and employees will be required to, uh, to have training and ongoing prevention training. The um, question is, can you define, is that all students or all employees? Or, um, what's your take on that? Um, it's all new students and all new employees. Uh, for the direct, and there's two phases to this. There's a direct component which is applied to the new students and new employees, and that's one-to-one -one training, and it can be delivered in person or it can be delivered electronically, for example. Um, the ongoing education is designed to cover the entire campus community, and that would include things like poster campaigns, floor programs, uh, messages on campus cable, etc. General education, general reinforcement. Uh, what we've seen is that one-time interventions are not sufficient to change culture. Uh, required intervention in education is something that is required to actually push the social change that we're looking for. So that's what that is. In the intention, we recognize that uh, it's going to probably take you know four years before everyone on campus. Uh, will have had the one direct one-to-one -one training that is called for under the SAVE Act. But in the long term, uh, eventually everyone will be receiving the one-to-one -one training. You know, after that fourth year, uh, every student on the campus will have received the one-to-one -one training. And there may be a slightly longer period of time for employees. Uh, but eventually, uh, in the long term, everyone will have received the education. And it can certainly be offered to all students and employees if an institution chooses to. Great. So, so it sounds like, Daniel, then if, if we were to kind of put that in a, in a summary, if, if somebody were to really just go and try to meet the, the minimum requirements, we've got a, sounds like there's a call to action here uh, before the fall semester of 2014-2015 that it would be, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, all new students and all new employees must receive, uh, must receive uh, education, training, and awareness. Is that correct? And it must be direct, one-to-one, -one in some format. It can be in person, online, but yes, by the beginning of the 2014 school year, uh, every new student and every new employee must receive some form of direct educational programming. Wonderful. Yeah, sounds great. So um, looks like we got the results in from the poll. Uh, interesting. Um, you can see, Daniel, that we've got a uh, good majority of the folks, just under half, uh, say that they do have uh, ongoing. Uh, ongoing is, is something that is not just a, a check in the box, if you will, saying that we've trained them once, but that it needs to continue year after year. Uh, but 43% roughly say that they have it, but they're not sure if it meets the requirements. So um, 
and then there's a, a few of those that are uh, only training the faculty and staff. So uh, interesting results there. Um, so Daniel, yeah, we will uh, we will continue, uh, please. Thank you. Now, certainly a lot of, I think many institutions are cognizant now that there's been stepped up attention and enforcement of um, the requirements under Title IX and the Clery Act. And the Campus Save Act is designed to complement uh, the Title IX requirements and enhance the existing Clery Act requirements. Uh, and there are some certain specific differences as to how the new law applies as considered to the laws that have are currently in effect. Um, it applies to students and employees specifically. So that's one area where it is specifically different from uh, Title IX, is that employees have explicit rights. And these rights are triggered when any report is made to the institution. And when a student or employee reports that they've been the victim of a sexual assault, an incident of dating violence, domestic violence, or stalking, they are entitled to receive written notification of their rights and options. And that can take the form of a piece of paper, a card, uh, an email. Um, and one important point is that they ought to have the option to decline. Uh, to take, they have to be offered it, but they need the option to decline it. For example, if they're in an abusive relationship they, and they don't want to risk having that found, um, they have an option to not take it or to discard it. So that's important. But the institution must offer it. And it should be a summary of all of the rights and options that we're going to explore here in the next few moments. And the policies and procedures are going to be based on the statement of policy that must be included in the annual security report. It must include a statement about the importance of preserving evidence for the possibility of a criminal prosecution if that's what the victim chooses to pursue. Should include who to report to. Now, there are many officials at the institution who are going to have obligations if it's an incident is reported to them. This, however, is an institution's opportunity to make a recommendation about the point of contact for reporting. For example, an institution could designate their campus police department, their dean of students, and their human resources department as the three preferred points of contact. Uh, or if there's an office that deals with sexual violence uh, prevention and response, they could also designate, designate that office as a preferred point of contact. Uh, the statement must also include information about options for reporting to the police, either on campus or local police and a statement that the institution will assist the student or employee uh, in reporting to law enforcement. And it, that doesn't mean every official who receives a report has an obligation to assist, but someone at the institution will assist them, and the person to whom they report should be in a position to know who that is and be able to get them in touch with that assistance. Uh, victims also have the right to decline to file a formal report, and they're still entitled to all of their other rights and options under the Act, even if they decline to file a formal police report or a formal report uh, of any kind with the institution. And this is something that has actually long been the case, uh, but the new Campus Save Act uh, makes that explicit. So for example, uh, changes to academic arrangement, class, you know, switching from one class to another, cannot be tied to a requirement that a victim make a formal report to the police department. The institutions must disclose in their annual security report as well as the written statement provided to any victim information about existing counseling, health, mental health, victim advocacy, legal assistance, or other resources. And the Department of Education has previously said under, this, under the existing requirement for the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights that direct contact information for each of these resources must be provided. And if no resources are available, this must be specifically spelled out in the Annual Security Report. 
Hopefully that will not be the case for any institution, but if there are no resources available, that simply must be noted. There also must be a statement, and there are some new dynamics here because in the past this has been a requirement that applied exclusively to students of an institution. It now implies to all students and employees who report. Um, accommodations and changes must be made for them if they are requested and reasonably available. And as I said, they are not required to report to the police in order to receive these accommodations. And the classifications uh, of accommodations that must be provided are changes to academic arrangements. So this, for example, could mean moving a victim from one class section to another. Or if they formally reported and disciplinary action has been initiated, for example, preferably it would include moving the accused to another class section. But for example, they haven't filed a report and don't want the accused to know, it could mean moving them from one class section to another. Now one of the biggest deficiencies we've seen is oftentimes the Campus Police or Security Department will put this in their policy statement in the annual security report. But when it gets down to the individual academic department, um, they don't have a policy or procedure in place to actually carry it out. So it's critical that this be an institution-wide policy with individual policies and protocols in place in individual academic departments to make sure that this can be carried out. Um, changes to living arrangements, such as changing from one residence hall to another, um, or being let out of a residence hall contract would typically be considered a reasonable accommodation. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education has said, for example, though, that uh, providing an off-campus apartment would probably not be a reasonable accommodation. Um, but certainly letting someone out of a housing contract would be considered a reasonable accommodation. Uh, changes to transportation arrangements, so for example, changing the parking place of someone who has been the incident of a victim of domestic violence so that their uh, abuser does not know where to find their parking space. And similarly for working arrangements, um, you know, if someone, if their uh, current or former partner knows where they work and is a potential threat to them, um, and it's possible to move them to a more secure private location or at least a different location, and that's a reasonably available option, the institution will have that obligation uh, once that incident is reported. Institutions must also adopt and disclose in their annual security reports an explicit confidentiality policy that states that institutions must protect victim confidentiality. And one of the biggest fears that we see we, we, among victims of these types of offenses is that their information will be shared publicly or with potentially their uh, assailant or intimate partner. And this applies to all institutional records and partly because it also covers employees um, as well as actually uh, non-affiliates who may be affected as well. This is separate and apart from FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And there must be a statement about how public record keeping uh, will be structured to keep information as confidential as possible. And now in some jurisdictions, complete confidentiality, particularly when an incident is reported to law enforcement or going through the court system, will not be possible. Uh, in that case, the policy should make it clear the distinction between confidential and non-confidential reporting options. So if an incident is reported to law enforcement and in your jurisdiction the public records law requires that the names of the individuals involved be included in a public police report, uh, that should be stated. This law does not supersede that, but it makes it clear to the person who will be reporting what their options are and, you know, one way is confidential, one way is not. Now for conduct proceedings, you know, this has been particularly important of late. Um, we've seen lots of incidents of students coming forward saying, and students both accused and accusers, uh, coming forward and saying that they don't feel they were treated fairly. 
And the idea of the Campus Save Act is that we can eliminate the re-victimization of victims and make sure that the accused receive the due process that they're owed um, so that institutions you know, won't be facing uh, concerns or potential liability from either side uh, by the enhancements provided by the Campus Save Act. Um, the policy statement and the underlying policies for both students, employees, and anyone affiliated with the institution who may be subject to conduct uh, action, procedures must provide a prompt, fair, and impartial investigation and resolution. And the exact definition of prompt um, is something that will likely be subject to the negotiated rulemaking process as well as the forthcoming handbook. Currently, Title IX guidelines talk about typically resolving a case within 60 days. Um, the officials who are handling any conduct proceedings must receive annual training. And this is not the annual training uh, or training that is to be received by all campus community members or new employees or new students. This is training specific to how to investigate and conduct a hearing. And the hearing must be structured such that it's designed to protect the safety of victims and promote accountability. Uh, the policy statement must also include the range of possible sanctions. And typically this ranges from probation, suspension, expulsion, or termination for employees. And it should be as, must be specific um, at, for each type of violation which range of sanctions exist. In most cases, I would imagine, um, the full range of sanctions would probably apply to all cases. There may be, there, there is a push that uh, some, inst you know, some institutions to um, not permit some type of probation or suspension for more serious violations. And if your institution that adopts a policy to that effect, um, then there would need to be a differential. For example, if you permit the full range for dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking, but for sexual assault, um, the only options are suspension or expulsion or termination, um, then that should be explicit in your policy statement. Daniel, um, we got a, if I could pause for a second, I think it's a good, uh, good time. We had a, a few questions coming through the line here. Um, would you be able to quickly just address, um, sounds like universities not only have to, to provide training in the near future, but they're also going to have to update their policies and procedures accordingly. Uh, to reflect these changes. A good question here is when can we expect to see an updated handbook uh, for the campus safety and security reporting from the, de the Department of Education and OCR office? Um, well, the, the Clery Act handbook actually will, is separate from the Office for Civil Rights. And I have spoken with the contractor who provides the handbook to the Department of Education and received assurances that, that they are in the process of working on it. Um, but also they've said that it will be forthcoming after the new regulations come out. And the reasons for that are obvious. Um, they need to rely on the new final guidance. So the new final guidance is expected to be available approximately a year from now, probably by November 1st of 2014. The handbook necessarily, while they will be working on it, parallel to the regulatory process, we'll have to follow that. So we're probably looking at sometime um, late 2014, early 2015 at the earliest. That's one of the reasons the Department of Education in a letter in May said that they will expect good faith efforts. And that, so if an institution makes a good faith effort but doesn't get something quite specifically right, um, then um, it is unlikely they would face a sanction for that. Uh, mainly institutions have to make the effort. At that, it, for this first year, that's the key takeaway. They have to make that good faith effort. If they get something slightly technically wrong prior to the Department of Education explaining exactly what the specific requirement is, they are unlikely to be sanctioned for that. Right. So then in your, in your own words, Daniel, would it be safe to say then that um, a good faith effort, uh, if, if a college or university were to uh, begin to train their new students, their new employees 
update their policies and procedures and start re reporting as, as to the best of their knowledge uh, incidents of sexual violence and domestic violence and stalking, that that would satisfy that um, requirement, but uh, maybe just a little bit more on, you know, what, I guess, what would not be an example of what not to do there? You know, what would, well, what would for, that look for, like? Well, for example, what would be an example of not good faith requirement, uh, not, you know, not trying in good faith would be not doing any of those things or leaving any of those things out. You know, not starting the new training, not cha updating the policies and procedures. Um, that would be an example of not a good faith effort. Basically, doing nothing. So, you may not get it 100% on the mark, but doing nothing would not be good faith. Or leaving an important area out, for example. Um, so, say you offer the education to new students and employees, but you don't offer an ongoing program. Or you don't uh, offer training to your hearing personnel. Uh, that, you know, those would be significant issues of compliance that are clearly statutory issues. They don't require specific regulatory guidance. Um, and institutions could find themselves at risk. So, for example, if they're not offering one-to-one um, -one education for new students and employees by the fall of 2014, um, that would be a compliance problem. Great. Thank, thanks, Daniel. I know we're, uh, we're getting short on time. We've got about uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, so um, I appreciate that. And we have a few more slides to go through, and then we have uh, a, a Q&A. Um, both accuser and, as I've said consistently, this is about equitability. Accuser and accused must have the same opportunity to have others present and including an advisor of their choice at any hearing or related proceeding. And this is a variation on the longstanding requirement that they must have the same opportunity to have others present. Previously, they could, an institution could say, you both have the equal opportunity to have no one present. Uh, the intention of this change was that this would change that, that they would always be entitled to an advisor. There have been questions raised about who the advisor may be. Currently, some institutions place limits on who the advisor may be, such as you may not bring your parent, you may not bring an attorney, you must limit the advisor to someone from within our community. Uh, student employee, for example. Um, and this is something that's going to be discussed during the regulatory process, but the way I read it is that they may bring anyone of their choice, and the key is that it is an advisor. It is not someone who is entitled to be actively engaged in the process. They are merely there to advise the accused or accuser. So that is, my, that is my reading on it. It's something that will, the final guidance will be dictated by the regulations and the new handbook, but that is how I read it. Um, and also new is both accuser and accused must be simultaneously informed in writing. And this is something that was recommended in the Dear Colleague letter, but not an explicit requirement in statute. It now is. Uh, the outcome of the preceding procedures for appeal that's a new requirement. Any changes in results, that's a new requirement. And when such results become final, that's also new. Um, that they must be informed at each step in the process. And yes, this does mean both accused and accuser have an opportunity to appeal the initial results. So that is a new requirement, and that is something that was recommended by the Dear Colleague letter, but is now, again, a clery requirement. Under, I think we're, for a description of what the outcome means, we're, I look to FERPA, which offers the best description of what should be contained in the final results. It means a decision or determination made by an honor court or council, committee, commission, or other entity authorized to resolve disciplinary matters within the institution. The disclosure of the final results must include only the name of the student, and in this case, I think we're going to expand that to include employees and others, the violation committed, and any sanction imposed by the institution against the student. And when we talk about the violation under FERPA, that also includes an explanation of how the honor court committee or other entity reached that, de that determination. So and the essential findings that led them to that result should be included in the results as well as the duration of the sanction imposed. For example, if they are suspended for three years, 
it should be clearly noted that they're suspended for three years. Thank you, Daniel. We are at the, um, our next uh, polling question here. So if we could uh, take a look here. How confident are you in your reporting capabilities? Have the results uh, coming through here. And Daniel, it seems to be quite a few questions coming in. I know that um, it's, it's a hot topic and it certainly generated uh, quite a bit of interest this afternoon. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to answer, get to all of those. We've got well over 100 coming through the queue. Um, but here shortly, uh, we will have a, uh, a short Q&A session as we wrap up, and we'll try to address those, uh, those that, we, that we certainly can. Um, so I think we are almost uh, done with the poll. And uh, let's see what the results are um, coming in. We've got roughly, wow, okay, uh, our highest rating yet that uh, folks are somewhat confident in their reporting capabilities. Um, and then we have um, a few folks that 37% uh, are very confident uh, that their current procedures and policies are in place as far as the reporting capabilities. So um, that's, uh, that, that's good to hear. Uh, and for those that are worried or not confident, um, we'll, hopefully we can help you out. So Daniel, I know we've got a few minutes left. I will let you uh, continue, and then we will do a, a, a wrap-up and a Q&A. Well, I'll try to get through the remainder, remaining slides pretty quickly. As I said, there will be a report uh, produced by the Department of Education on best practices uh, that will be provided to institutions, and this may be integrated into the forthcoming edition of the handbook. So institutions will not be left solely to their own devices to come up with these policies and procedures. There will be assistance. Uh, and the last uh, slide that I have is actually the, the new uh, retaliation, uh, anti-retaliation provision is that institutions may not retaliate or to discriminate against anyone who exercises any of their rights or responsibilities under the Act. So a victim who reports they can't be discriminated against. Uh, any institutional personnel who try to exercise any of their responsibilities such as meeting these requirements for reporting um, and are discriminated against or retaliated against for any reason for doing so, that is a separate violation of the Clery Act with $35,000 per violation penalties. It's not a private right of action or anything like that, but they do have, they are specifically protected. And Joe, with that, I'm done. Great. Well, I, I appreciate that, Daniel. I know we uh, squeeze a lot into, uh, into this hour here. Um, as we uh, look here on the next, uh, the next slide, we've got, um, you know, Daniel, it's, it's, I think some of the key takeaways are, uh, you know, uh, at least for me, that, um, you know, a, lot, a lot's happened since, uh, since March of this year. And um, clearly, we've got um, the, the Violence Against Women Act, also known as VAWA, of 213 will be one to remember. Uh, and the requirements, you know, they cross multiple areas uh, within a university or campus setting. Um, regards to the Clery, uh, Clery Act, talking with campus security and police, campus safety, uh, student affairs, you know, uh, a group that uh, uh, for some that may have training but now will be required to train new students. And then, of course, those that, uh, that have the Title IX coordinator as of the, the, the Title IX passing Dear Colleague letter of 2011. Uh, it's clear that there is still some, uh, you know, some unanswered questions that are uh, the rulemaking process that, uh, as you mentioned, Daniel, uh, would be to come in the, in the future. Uh, but the one thing is for sure that uh, when we talk about good faith efforts, um, that, that all universities and colleges in the United States uh, must put some type of plan or program in place that requires a combination of training, education and awareness, policy and procedure updates, uh, and then you, you, I think you touched on ongoing awareness. So uh, it's not just a, a one-time deal, but the preventing sexual violence in college campuses across the U.S. today will require an ongoing awareness campaign. Uh, this slide just represents here the workplace answers uh, solution to assist those folks uh, in the higher education community that uh, they may 
Um, so we've got a combination here of, of online training courses, uh, specifically Title IX, uh, Sexual Violence Awareness Prevention, versions that address the faculty, the staff, and the employees, and then specific versions for those students. Uh, and so that, that is one of the elements that you mentioned. The other would be uh, the new case management tool. This would be for reporting the incident hotline. We have uh, anonymous hotline uh, assistance and also um, some guidance on the policy and procedures guide. So um, we, uh, we certainly um, see it as, as, as something that is, uh, uh, I know, near and dear to your heart, Daniel, and I, I appreciate you again being able to, uh, um, to uh, join us today. We just have uh, one last question here, and then I think we will go to the, uh, we'll be going to uh, the, the final Q&A. So um, for those folks on the line, we just want to get a gauge your interest level. Um, if you do click interested, um, we, we'd be happy to have one of our uh, consultants uh, reach out to you. Uh, so please click that. Or uh, if you just need more information, uh, please let us know. Okay, and with that, well, that's going, Daniel. Let's see if I can take, uh, take a line here uh, for questions. Boy, we've got quite a few. Um, uh, we've got a question here from Karen. Under traditional Title VII, sexual harassment a, admin action. Go ahead. I was just going to say for those, I'm, I'm probably most people on the line are familiar with Title VII as employment law. It's similar to Title IX. Okay. Uh, this question has to do with harassment actions. It's been discouraged to disrupt the routine of victim rather than move the victim or the respondent would be moved. The question is, does the same apply when making accommodations or changes to arrangements under the SAVE Act? The preference is to limit the disruption to the victim, uh, if at all possible. So ideally, you would be moving the accused, for example, um, but for example, if they don't want the accused to know that they've made a report, that's the type of circumstance where you would want to move them from one class section to another or change where they work, uh, for example. But yes, the preference Great. is to limit the disruption to the victim. Great. We have another question here from Cindy. Uh, for risk reduction, our campus recently received backlash from faculty following a crime alert posted for faculty, staff, and students that it was blaming the victim. What advice do you have, Dan, on being mindful of victim blaming and developing risk reduction education and awareness? Well, one example, is, well, one approach is you can reframe it. For example, risk reduction can be redefined to mean how to identify potential behavior and encourage bystanders to intervene as opposed to saying don't walk alone at night. So you, can so you can reshape risk reduction for the 21st century. Got it. Uh, another one here, Daniel, is I guess going back to, uh, we have a, a question here from Mark. Uh, it says, Daniel, where in the actual Campus Save Act and or regulations does it require training of all new students and new employees, uh, you know, i.e., so I haven't seen that language. Um, well, it's 20 U.S.C. 1092F8BI, um, uppercase I, um, and that's the statutory language. Um, and it's not in regulations yet because the regulations don't yet exist. But it's 20 United States Code Section 1092F8B. Uh, uh, I, and it states that, um, I mean, I, it, it's actually a fairly long paragraph, um, but it states that education programs to promote the awareness of rape, acquaintance rape, domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking, which shall include primary prevention and awareness programs for all incoming students and new employees, which shall include, and then it goes through the list of things that it has to include. But that's the site. Right. Sounds like you. And, and if you if you you can email me at sdcarter at vtvfamilyfoundation.org and I can get you the exact citation if you want it. Great. Thank thank you, Daniel. I know we are uh, wrapping up here. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for for any more questions. But I did want to uh, thank you again for joining us today, Daniel, uh, for an excellent and wonderful presentation. 
for those on the line, please visit WorkplaceAnswers.com for more information on sexual violence prevention, awareness, Title IX, alcohol abuse, and other training courses, as well as how we might be able to help promote a safer campus for your college or university. This now concludes today's webinar.